right. All right. Can everyone see the slides? All right, perfect. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our session um, titled Incorporating Current Events into Your Teaching Practice to Foster Critical Self-Awareness, Transformation, and Belonging. I'm Brian McGowan. I am a Provost Associate Professor here in the School of Education, and I'm also one of the Associate Directors in CTRL. Felton. Hey, I'm Felton Moss. Uh, I'm a Senior Professorial Lecturer of Ed Policy and Leadership in the School of Education and an Inclusive Pedagogy Fellow in the Center for Teaching, Research, and Learning. Excited to be here with you all today. Awesome. And before we jump into this content, um, a session that we're both really excited about that we've been dreaming about for like the past year plus now. So thank you for CTRL for allowing us space to engage in this conversation. But um, I want to do a shameless plug very quickly. Um, happy to be in community with my dear friend and colleague, um, Felton. Um, but he's one of our inclusive pedagogy faculty fellows. And one thing that you'll see throughout the year, for those who are not familiar with our inclusive pedagogy program, uh, we have uh, four to five fellows, depending on a given year, that are resources to the campus, who have a wealth of knowledge, who are doing a lot of robust and innovative projects um, centered around inclusive pedagogy. And so you'll see um, the faculty fellows um, throughout the year in a series, but you'll get to know them in various ways. And so this is one of the ways. So um, Felton, thank you for being in the community today. With that being said, let's jump into what we're hoping to accomplish today. Um, so again, Felton and I, we are both faculty members in the School of Education. And a lot of the work that we do, um, it's nice, the synergies in terms of SOE's vision, mission, and commitment to anti-racism, it's very seamless in terms of how we think about our praxis. And it's nice to work in a place that shares our values. So we'll talk a little bit about those pieces. We'll talk about some of the objectives of, of today. Um, and we have two opportunities for you to engage in what we're calling learning from the room. Hello, you are the room. So we will be learning together in a co-constructed way. Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about some of the frameworks and philosophies that informs our approach to current events. We've been doing this work for a while. We've learned some things along the way. And so we'll talk about some of the frameworks and philosophies that undergird our thinking in terms of how we approach our work. We'll let you into our assignment and actually how we go about doing that because um, current events can be a vehicle to build an inclusive classroom. And that's the goal here. Another engagement opportunity as well, learning from the room. Again, you are the room. And then we'll end talking about just some broader lessons learned. You know, a lot of times you design assignments and things go well, but then there's some things that you learn along the way. And so we'll be vulnerable and share some of those pieces. And with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to Felton to talk a little bit about the SOE pieces. Yeah, no, thank you, Brian. I, I was sitting here thinking as you were talking about things that have gone wrong. Um, this activity, I was like, I can't wait to talk about that. Um, but I think what's critical for us uh, is to really center our work around what is true for us in our intellectual home, and that's the School of Education. And as we think about current events, our core vision at the SOE is to be able to make a meaningful impact in the field through innovative teaching, research, and service. And what I have found to be true in current events is that students are often bringing in examples of innovation, innovative teaching examples of really good quality research, um, as well as they're looking at the work that some of our colleagues are doing in terms of service to our community and in terms of our nation and our state. And so this current event work runs and sits squarely with our vision. The last thing I think, you know, we think about our impact. Uh, we, we really achieve our impact is through these inclusive learning environments that we build. And so I see um, creating current events as central to our core vision of creating inclusive learning environments. So I just really wanted to make this connection to our vision. I think the second thing I wanna um, make the, the connection to is our mission. And um, we have a pretty robust mission at the School of Education, and it's to create knowledge and prepare students to transform societies through education. And when I give you an example of the way in which we've structured the current events in my ed policy courses, it's really about transforming societies and, and how education can play a critical role in that. So. Um, I'll turn it back over to my colleague, um, Brian, to share a little bit more around our, our commitment to anti-racism. Absolutely. And, you know, um, and for those who have been here a few years, um, you know, in, the SOE became an independent school of education in 2019. And part of that, you know, again, from the ground up, like thinking about mission and vision and who we are and what do we stand for, but also our commitments to anti-racism. And, 
So on this slide here, as you'll see, this is our collective commitment, but it's not just a document that we read. Like this is actually something that we embody as faculty members, staff members, and students um, in the School of Education. And so the goal here is a commitment to analyzing self, systems, mindsets, ideologies, and practices. It's not fixed. It's not, I do this one time, great, and it's over. It's a continual learning process. There's also articulated accountability. And so one way that we demonstrate this is through our courses, right? So as faculty members, we are able to design courses that's embedded in anti-racism. Fortunately, I actually teach a course that's titled Equity, Diversity, and Anti-Racism. And so I'll talk about the current events that I do in that course. But it's important for each of us to do this. Like, how are we disrupting, um, to Felton's point, like active transformation, like we should be transforming lives in this course. And how do we do that? And what does that look like? And it's everyone's responsibility. And so one takeaway here, again, and you hear the term anti-racism, and particularly in this post, um, in this COVID period, this post-George Floyd, anti-racism has been a term that you have seen in many places. But this is not something that we just use as terminology. It is something that we actively strive towards. Um, and I'm just happy to work in a unit that act actually have these conversations on a continual basis. And as a result of those conversations, we're able to actually individually employ these things in our respective courses. So our objectives for today and what we're hoping to accomplish is that uh, participants will identify how to craft course assignments that incorporate current events into their classes. And also participants will describe how to incorporate current events into their teaching philosophy and pedagogical approaches. Why current events, Felton? Yeah, I, I think it's really important um, for us to really level set why current events. So I did write a piece for the CTRL blog, shameless plug, if you've not read it, you should. Hey. <laughs> um, and I actually wrote about current events as a high school student. And, you know, quick story, I wasn't able to share it all there, but, you know, I, I went to high school in Mississippi. I was raised there and we had to do a current event assignment for my U.S. history class. And one of my classmates did research on a guy named Fox Connor, who was a major general in World War II. And as a result of that, we were able to work with our county board and commission to get welcome to Calhoun County, home of Major General Fox Connor signs up and, and and now we're able to honor someone who was a, a huge part of American history, huge part of our local history. And so that current event actually opened the door uh, for me to learn more about my community. So I started thinking about how do I actually do that inside of my classroom? And, and current events are just what bullet point one or one says. It is truly a way to support students in understanding the core content and comprehension. So you know, my current event inside of my classroom is not divorced from the week's work. And I'll show you that in just a moment. They are really looking at the readings from the course for that module and thinking about what is a policy issue that's actually happening in our world and society that would better help students to understand some of the policy challenges or the unique ways in which we should be building policy to address some of the challenges that are faced. So they really serve as a way of helping students to go deeper. Number two, which is one I really like, uh, my teaching got better, Brian, as a result of current events. Uh, my students were able to employ pedagogical moves that I would have never imagined. And now they are part of my toolbox. And, and what that means is I'm actually getting more tools to build more engaging and inclusive classrooms that really meets the needs um, of, of students who come, from, who come to us from all backgrounds and walks of life. I think the final one um, is I really wanna talk about how these current events help students and faculty to engage in history and critical self-awareness. Uh, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about one of my frameworks in just a moment, but it was really powerful for students to start doing the real deep equity work of understanding yeah. the ways in which they've perpetuated white supremacy culture. Um, you, you would hear students say, wow, when I was a school teacher, I did that in my classroom. Or, I mean, literally, students were having moments inside of the classroom talking about this. Number two, um, actively transform their ways of being, acting, and doing. That's largely connected to the number one way in which these tools help. But I heard students say, I don't want to do that anymore, right? As a result of this learning experience and the way in which we process a policy decision, I've got to change the actor that I am in the system. I've got to wholly shift my accepted wisdom about how things have been done. And then finally, this sense of belonging, right? I had a student um, who was not an American student who was able to infuse their culture 
into our classroom learning environment. Um, you know, we got to learn a little Russian last semester. It was absolutely amazing um, because the student was able to bring their sense of community, their sense of home. And it was probably one of the first times they felt like they belonged inside of the space. So current events really, that is why we do current events. Um, I'll turn it over to you, Brian. Thank you for that context. And so as we stated, there will be some opportunities to learn from the room. And so this is the first one of them. Before we jump into our approaches and what we do, we would love to just learn, you know, a little bit more about like why you're here, but also thinking about these questions that we have here. The first one being, how do you currently engage students in history and critical self-awareness? How does your instruction help students transform their ways of being, action, and doing? And what pedagogical moves do you hold space for to create belonging in your classroom? And so the way that we'll approach this, um, feel free to jump in. We will love engagement on camera if possible. Um, also, you can feel free to type in the chat. So we'll be following both, but we will love some discussion. So what, what's happening? How do you currently engage students in these pieces? Let's get some, some dialogue going. Feel free to engage however you see fit with the guiding questions. You know, and as faculty members, we know how to sit in silence. So that this is a good thing for us. Extra credit. All right, I'll go. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You're if, welcome. If, if you come on, if you could just say your name and like how you're affiliated, that would be great. Yes. Uh, my name is Elizabeth Geltman. I'm actually a visiting professor here at American University. I'm here for the year. I'm visiting from the CUNY School of Public Health. Um, and I am in the Department of Health Studies. Um, and I use current events in a lot of different ways. Um, one of the most effective ways I've done is that students will have a research project, which they have to do ongoing throughout the semester, but I ask them to collect current events on their project, and they're required to contribute them at least three times during the semester. So we start each class with a current event, and that, you know, that's supposed to be on topic, um, supposed to be being the, the, <laughs> the, 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 um, uh, the challenge. Um, but it often kicks off a really, really robust discussion in a direction that I hadn't intended and that makes things really interesting and valuable to both me and the students. Awesome. I love the example around like a, a semester long project. So, right. So another thing in this co-constructed learning from each other. And again, you'll get our examples in a second. But I love this because there's so many ways that you can incorporate current events. There's no one right way. So I, I appreciate that embedding it in a semester long assignment. What are some other reactions to our guiding questions? And let me see in the chat. I teach creative writing this semester and the personal essay assignment requires students to reflect on important memories or aspects of their personalities, all right? So it sounds like there's an assignment where there could be a current event. Let's see, let me read the other one then I'm gonna bring in Moya. Let's see, facilitating centering grounding work in the midst of what is happening in their campus community and society. All right, you wanna elaborate there? I do, and thank you for the <laughs> opportunity. Uh, my name is Moya Malcolm. I'm a postdoctoral fellow in the School of Education, so I'm looking forward to meeting uh, you, Brian, and Felton soon in person. Um, so my background is in school counseling, and <clears throat> excuse me, I had the pleasure of teaching the first year experience course for first year students at the University of Maryland for the past two fall semesters, and so a lot of that work my approach to that work was in the midst of all this change, right? It's their first semester at a university. What do you bring with you? What do you know to be true? Um, and, and what will anchor you in the midst of everything that is going on around you on, in camp, on campus, in your um, home communities and society at large? And so that's the approach that I um, would love to continue to take in uh, my future courses that I teach, because regardless of what I teach, I think it's just so important to um, acknowledge and dig into current events and also who you are within the context of this world. And so thank you for the opportunity. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. And we look forward to you to continuing to do that as well. So yes, and 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 similar. We'll love to look forward to meeting you soon. Um, what are some other reactions to the questions? Thank you for those who have engaged thus far. Any other reactions? We definitely have time. I can share out just a little bit. Um, Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, y'all. I'm Amanda. Um, I work over with the um, with first year advising and teaching the AU Experience course, um, and so. I find that a lot of time, I don't know when it really started. I'm sure people who um, were a part of that program before I started could offer a little more context. But um, at some point, the AUX classroom just kind of became the spot to talk about things that were happening around campus um, for, if, you know, things were happening on campus and students needed a space to kind of process that um, or things were happening in the world um, to kind of have a, just like a like small uh you know, comfortable, sometimes uncomfortable space to have just conversations that were really important. Um, and also just like have space to like think about how we're coming into our other classes and so on and so forth. So I guess in in a way, um, just kind of AUX has become the spot to, to do a little bit of this. Um, so like, for example, last year we had the like a staff strike and our first classes kind of became a, a processing space for our first year students of like what was it like to move into campus in the middle of a strike right rather than mm -hmm. what would be the the normal syllabus week or um when there's instances of racism on campus you know think, talking about okay how how is AU an institution right that perpetuates racism and how do we kind of combat that as as students or how do we you know try to just grapple with that on in our daily lives and then also looking at like what needs to change then for our campus and then also our world and so on and so forth so just trying to like contextualize that a little bit um but also mm -hmm. like our assignments are very student reflective centered um just trying to like uh it's kind of like give them an opportunity to learn how to practice self-reflection um and then also looking then at you know how does this work out outside of just you and AU and, and into a, uh, AUX2 where they look a little bit more, you know, bigger picture. Um, but yeah. No, Amanda, I appreciate you bringing in the um, AUX piece. And I know there are others on this call who also teach AUX um, courses. And so I'm sure um, a lot of what you said resonates with some others on the call as well. But the piece that stood out to me here is my course became a place to talk about current events, right? So we're talking about how we deliberately came into our courses, centering current events in two different ways. And we also heard examples of how faculty are doing that in other types of assignments. But then you just introduce another variable where current events became that, right? So it's, there's also this thing where, as I think about my teaching and my planning, when things evolve, how do I adapt for those pieces? And so I appreciate that example as well. And we can talk more about those pieces as well. I'll give one or two more examples and we'll keep going just to make sure. Felton, let's see, we got Lucy's comment and Rebecca's comment here. Let's see. Yeah, I'm happy to have Rebecca's um, in that students and comp Students in complex problems identified discussing current events as a way to connect the course content to the real world and their own lives and have a deeper understanding of how the topic of the course is relevant. Our program is interested in engaging more critical self-awareness, and I'm excited to learn more about how to deepen this for students. I don't know, Rebecca, if you want to say more about that, but I really appreciate this, this quotation around real world uh, as much as it can be. Mm -hmm. uh, would love to hear you uplift and, and voice over this if you're open to it. Good morning. Hi, I'm Rebecca, um, assistant director for AU Core, and so I manage the complex problems program. Um, so I'm not a, a teacher of the course myself, um, but we do a lot of program assessment. And so we had asked students a couple years ago to identify like in what ways their course is connected to the real world and current events came up as one of the ways that that was happening. So um, that's kind of what drew me into this session was that we had had that response from students and I was interested to see. Um, and then more recently, we've been hoping to um, kind of expand upon um, our diverse perspectives, learning outcomes, and how students are incorporating multiple perspectives, including their own critical self-awareness, um, and how to kind of 
I think just deepen what the engagement of that is. Sometimes it's really surface level. Sometimes it doesn't happen in the ways we might expect it to or hope it does in the classroom. Um, but I guess going back to the the real world connections, I think um, there's this kind of assumption sometimes that what we're learning in class, the content we're learning in class is ethereal and not something that's real, but actually our students are real and our faculty are real and are experiencing these things in real time, um, whether it's the learning or the context that they're learning within. Um, so I think we need to remind ourselves of that all the time, which is why I put those quotes. <laughs> no, awesome. And the final with Rebecca, thank you so much. And the final one we'll lift up here before we continue moving, Lucy, and reading yours. I actually want to take your course, Lucy. So I teach women in politics and students are required to use an intersectional lens to explore sex, race, class, and other identities throughout the semester. I also incorporate a weekly newsletter on women in politics issued by the AU Women in Politics Institute. So current events are discussed every week. So I love that you're using an outside resource as a way to just seamlessly do this, right? And so there's no one right way so let's transition a little bit. Um, and so thank you for those who engage and there'll be another opportunity again to engage. Um, but let's continue moving for the sake of time that we can talk a little bit about our frameworks and philosophies informing our praxis. And before we get into the weeds, I think it's important because we all are here, we're situated in different ways, right? We have different contexts, but I think it's important. And I love this, what we're about to do because we're talking about frameworks and philosophies but as you think about like your teaching philosophy and your praxis, how can current events play a role in that? We think about your pedagogies and your frameworks, right? So whether you're thinking about promotion and tenure, right? Whether you're thinking about like how I can be a better teacher, whether you are running a program and maybe these are like approaches that I can use with my faculty. So you all are positioned in different ways. And so hopefully this next segment can give you a way as an individual to think about my own praxis and how current events can play a role or in my administrative capacity working with faculty, how I can um, think about ways to embed frameworks into my administrative work. So with that being said, I'm gonna turn over to Felton and I just wanna shameless plug. I love the work that you're doing, Felton, and I've loved it for quite some time, which is why I asked you to partner with me in this today. And so I'm happy that the campus gets to see you and your element. So with that being said, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, um, Brian. It's always fun. Um, Brian's not going to say this, but Brian's my faculty mentor in the School of Ed. So it's pretty cool to be able to present uh, <laughs> with your faculty mentor who's respected across campus. So, so thank you, actually, for giving me this space and opportunity. Um, so I tend to lean into a liberatory conscious framework. I love the work of Dr. Barbara J. Love, and I'm centering her in this moment. And I'm trying to I'm trying to channel some of that Barbara J. Love energy as I'm sharing this framework with you all. Um, but I ask students inside of my class. Uh, well, I put I, I try to put students in a place in a position to build awareness, right? That they begin developing this capacity for noticing what's happening in our world. Now, I'm a policy professor, so. I teach our ed policy course. And I think in order to write good policy, you've got to have a deep capacity for noticing some of the systematic challenges so that you can sharply divide the language in such a way where it addresses the problem and it gets to the root cause of it. But often what happens in our work is, and I noticed this for quite some time in my own self, was that I would automatically try to get to action and allyship. And so, you know, Part of my work is to try to reverse that bad habit that not only I have, but sometimes students have, of going straight to action and allyship whenever they see a challenge or a problem. So what I ask them to do is to move over into what I call analysis. And this part is really important. And some of us can get stuck in that place, but many of us do not go to that place. Um, but I try to get students over into analysis. Then I try to get them to move over into accountability which is like, what is my role in this? And then move over to action and allyship. And so the entire structure and frame of my class is one of, of, of endeavoring to liberate not only the student, but folks that are around them that they actually have to make policies for. And analysis is a critical part of that. And I see current events um, as part of steps two and three and really helping students do the analysis work and then start taking accountability for what needs to happen. Now, let's talk about how I do that. And the next slide will, will show us how I do that. So uh, my current event is really a weekly critical policy review. 
And uh, students are given 20 minutes to complete the critical policy review protocol of a current event or a future policy proposal related to the current um, week's readings. And so they can do a review of a current or future policy. Um, someone in Congress or someone at the local school board can be proposing something new. They can redo, review a pop, do a review of that. Or it could be something that's been on the books for 15 years that need to be reviewed and need to be reversed or need to be changed or need to be celebrated. So um, we start there. Um, one of the rules there is that it, it has to be connected or draw on the current week's course readings. It is critical um, that it is relative to the current week's readings. Now, I, I think we can talk a little bit later about lessons learned in this part, but I, I started out with a strong posture that you gotta make a connection to the concepts or the theories um, that are evident in this week's reading and really show how the current event intersects with that. And that goes back to you know, my first idea around, it helps students have a deeper understanding of the core content of the course. And so I, I made that marriage there. Finally, um, students engage classmates in the presentation. So you know, there, there has to be an engagement activity. We're not gonna just hear you doing this review. We wanna see how you bring other students into the class. Um, yeah, and, and I see the question around the 20 minute exercise. We can talk about that. Um, a little bit later, um, given the length of my courses. Um, so I typically teach from about 7.30 to 9.20 um, for my courses, and it makes it a little bit hard to do this, but, but I'll share that in just a moment. But let me go to the next slide. These are um, one of the, you know, the overplanned me, the high school English teacher in me, said students need an anchor. And so I use the work of Sarah Dion to develop these critical policy review questions. And so I provided students with a set of questions to actually help them to do this work. What are the intentions of the policy? What does it aim to accomplish? And this actually enriches the core work of the class when students are actually walking through this. So to the question in the chat around, do I feel like I'm losing time? I really don't feel like I'm losing time because I've really structured this assignment in such a way where it focuses on the core content of the class. Um, you know. Finally, who has a voice in the policy process? Whose voice is currently silenced? Are the voices of racially minoritized groups elevated in the policy process? These are all questions that I'm exploring through every reading, every class, and students ask to start the lecture in that way. The next slide, please. Um, you know, I'm a little obsessive about this in that I have a set of points and a rubric for it. Um, and so, you know, in 20 minutes, you've got to highlight the current issue related to equity, diversity, anti-racism, and inclusion. It's 100 points, right? You've got to make a connection to our commitment to anti-racism. Uh, you've got 50 points to draw on the current. So I'm looking at to what extent are you leaning into the readings? And then your engagement. This is a 200-point exercise because it's 20 minutes. But this is the way um, in which I've leaned into current events. Um, it is not the way. It is one way. Uh, and happy to talk about some of the challenges with that a little bit later, but I want to turn it over to my colleague, Brian. I appreciate that. And so the ways I've done this, and I look forward to the lessons learned um, part of this as well, because I've experimented with this assignment in different ways. And so for me, I view and use current events more as an engagement opportunity Um I'm less concerned about the points, more so the more of a compliance type of exercise. Like everyone does it, you follow the rules, you get full credit type of thing. Um, but I root my um, teaching and pedagogy in three frameworks, right? So I, um, Arayo and Clemens Brave Space approach. I want to create an, an environment in my course that promotes bravery, uh, which is a departure. You think about safe space, but more so around bravery, right? So um, do you get partial points or is it specific grading all or nothing? So I'm going to assume this is for, for me. For me, it, it really is all or nothing, right? And so um, it really is. So for, um, it would be, I don't know how many points, depending on the semester, but whatever that percentage is, you do it, you get full credit. You don't do it, you get no credit, no points. So, and everyone tends to get points because everyone does it. Um, but Arayo and Clem is brave space. So how do you promote bravery, right? Um, I love Freire's critical pedagogy, right? And so not even familiar with the text, please read it because it's very foundational to who I am and how I teach. But I use critical pedagogy and also Sanford's theory of challenge and support. So providing adequate challenge, 
but also adequate support as well. So these are three frameworks that undergird, and I think the current events assignment fits very nicely. Um, and so you see these pictures here, I have like pictures of connecting because there's a lot of co-construction that happens in this space, but also thinking about bravery. And I wanna be very clear about promoting bravery and we can talk about this during the lessons learned or Q&A, but um, the assignment itself doesn't promote bravery, right? Like I do things in my course to create a space to promote bravery and the current event naturally is aligned with that. Um, but here are the instructions to my assignment. So in the beginning of my course, um, during the first day, uh, we go around, okay, how many students are in the course, how many current event presentations, and we do signups on that first day. So everyone knows which, knows which week they are required to do it. And in 20 minutes. And so it's really meant to be an engagement exercise. Again, I teach two, two and a half hour, three hour courses, just depending. Um, but within that larger block, um, for 20 minutes, for five minutes, you're giving an overview of the reading and some of the key points. Um, of the current event. And then the remaining 15 minutes is some type of dialogue that you must engage your classmates. So very quick. Um, and again, I'll talk about the lessons learned later, but some of the things that we had already mentioned, but this has been like a game changer for me as an instructor. I didn't do this early on in my teaching. And once I started incorporating current events, I started noticing some things happening in my classroom, deeper engagement, uh, more excitement for the material. Um, and so those pieces started happening naturally. And then students, you, we, we talk about how to co-construct learning environments. Well, naturally, this assignment does that. And the fact that it's a, more of a compliance exercise, students are more, um, more apt to do it uh, because they know they'll get full credit. So it's less about the points at this point and more about the actual, ooh, okay, so last week my one... Um, colleague did this um, activity. So I'm going to do a different type of activity. So it start, you started seeing different pedagogical approaches that the students were taking to even teach each other. And so I learned so much from my students and I've been doing this for easily close to a decade. So it's just been nice to kind of see the way the learning environment shifts by just this one assignment. So with that being said, um, before we jump in deeper, um, three ways that current events um, aim to build an inclusive classroom. So we talked about some of these pieces, but thinking about like engaging in history and critical self-awareness. And we always talk about like the idea that history informs the present, but we can learn so much from history, but history can inform the present. Um, we talked a lot about transformation and creating transformational um, opportunities. So actively transform their ways of being, acting and doing, right? So there's something about this assignment that does this, but beyond the assignment, your classroom should be spaces of transformation, right? Like I think about like just culturally responsive um, approaches to, to engaging students. And one of those outcomes of embodying a culture responsive engaging praxis is transformation, right? And so this assignment does that. And then the other part of it is fostering a sense of belonging. And I think that's the piece that um, through our conversations, Felton and I, over the years, that the belonging that happens in the classroom space is, is magical. It really is. And, and students feel like they are a part of the course, right? And so this is like their entry point where they can be themselves. They should be able to be themselves throughout, but they really see that in this assignment. Um, Felton, do you want to engage more here? Or did, did I capture that for you? I think you captured it. I want to, and this will get into the student comments in just a moment, but Brian, one of the, I think I want to be transparent here and how, how I got to this, right? I don't think I've shared how I got to this. I called Brian one day and I'm like, um, I've got to find, my course evaluations were fine, but I was like, I've got to find a way not to own all of this learning, right? I had this bias around there's so much knowledge that I want to impart into my students. Man, that just sounds crazy, right? <laughs> um, and, and I'm owning and doing all the thinking. I, I would have I would have fussed my teachers out when I was a middle school principal for doing this. And then I find myself in the college classroom just, and I knew I did not want to be what I had gotten in, in my graduate experience in my doctoral program where the professor was just reading from the slides and all of that. Um, and so Brian was like, hey, you know, this is one of the things that I've tried. Um, and I really built from that. And it was really grounded in. Uh, and, and I just learned along the way that these were the three things that happened from my students. But the original goal was to stop owning all the, the learning, to stop doing all the thinking inside the space 
and to be dramatically, overwhelmingly different from what I experienced in my graduate studies. And it led me to this. So I, I wanted to just be transparent about how I got there. Um, and there was a student who took my class before I started doing the current events versus when I take it now. And they're like, oh, yeah, you did talk too much in the other class. This is perfect. Like you, you figured out how to engage us. Your teaching has gotten way better. So I had to be, I had to, to acknowledge that in this space that this was about shifting my praxis as a teacher because I care deeply about, you know, my students having a sense of belonging. I care deeply about them walking away from a policy class, thinking about, oh, the way in which history impacts policy, thinking about their role in, in being a shaper and a former and a disruptor of policy ideas. And so I had to do something dramatically different because that was my goal. Yeah. I love the reflection there. And, and, and that's what it's about, right? <laughs> like it's about doing something, assessing it, reflecting, doing something different, building on it. I love this framework. So thanks for offering that. All right, let's get into it. So I think that I want to um, just uplift, you know, the first one, current events as a tool for engaging students around history and critical self-awareness. On the next slide, you have a comment from Ethan, one of my students. And Ethan says, our presence in the timeline of history is lost in fulfilling the obligations of the present. And he really argues that the current event was an opportunity to disrupt this, this notion that because we are situated in, in, at this place in the timeline, you know, all of that historical context actually gets lost in fulfilling the work that we need to do in the present. And this came about because we were studying the Coleman Report. And we look back around to how this seminal document in American history has shaped every education policy decision in the country. And he was able to use his current event to bring it back to the present. And so this is a quote from him as a student and, and how it actually impacted his individual learning. So I wanted to uplift some student voice here. I'll go to the next one. Current event as a tool for belonging. I think, and you'll see on the next slide, Brian, um, this student said current event activities and discussions. I, I want to name here that this student, you know, it wasn't just about the activity for this student. We talked about building critical self-awareness. It was the level of discussion that took place as a result of the current event activities as well that really led to a period of emotional self-reflection in our classroom. I want to name for you that we, we had to, there were moments inside of our space where we had the whole time because it was emotional. Students start thinking about the ways in which they had shown up. Um, and we often talk in my classroom about calling in versus calling out. There were moments where we had to call folks in and, um, and it really allowed students to draw on their personal experiences, educators and students to gain deeper insights. One example of this is, you know, we had Arnie Duncan to come to our class um, who was the former secretary of education. And it became an emotional moment because there was a student who went to Chicago public schools and who was directly impacted by the decisions that you know, he had made when he was the CEO of Chicago schools. And we had a current event activity that really forced the student to reflect on that experience. And it was some deep trauma work that we had to work through, but it was good for us inside the class in that moment in that students were able to support one another along the journey. And then the third one, if you'll go to the next one, Brian, um, current events as a tool for actively transforming the way of being and doing. This last quote from a student on the next slide, um, the current event tool actively transformed my engagement, engagement with new information from all sources. So I want to focus on the all sources here. This particular student had a tendency to engage with some sources, right? Sources that were germane to their belief system, right? You know, they, they were only going to read the Wall Street Journal and not New York Times, they were gonna only read from Ed Trust and not read from Brookings or and the like. And so the current event actually presented an opportunity for them to engage with new information from a number of sources, sources that would they would never uh, approach because they didn't feel like it aligned with them ideologically or philosophically. And so this current event tool really had them to do something different in terms of their research and practice. I wanna see if there are any questions or reactions to the students' comments um, for me and, and, and how I may, how we may have gotten to this place where this was their comment about current events. So I just want to hold space for questions now before we um, before we move on. 
or reactions. You don't have to ask. I'm not the beholder of all knowledge. So if you want to react to this or want to share a direct experience, um, please do so. You know, while while people are thinking here, I can speak for some of my CTRL colleagues. I'm sure they appreciate that you're centering student voices in this presentation. So <laughs> I'm thinking of some of my colleagues in particular, right, in this moment. Yeah. Love to see if there are reactions, wanderings, questions, or thoughts about this before. Turn it back over to my colleague, Brian, for learning from the room part two. All right. Oh, no, so there's a question, sorry. Oh, there is a question. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right. Do you ask students to report on the current events via multiple sources or did they do that themselves? Um, that happened organically, but I will say um, my students write two memos um, and they're giving lots of feedback about multiple sources. So that could come from that exercise. But in this particular exercise, I do not call upon them to use multiple sources. So um, it has kind of happened organically, but, you know, another confounding variable can be that I'm going to hold you accountable in your policy memo <laughs> from multiple sources. And so students are probably expecting the same to be true in this exercise. Thank you for that. Any other questions? All right. If you have them, feel free to post them in the chat. Um, and as we stated, we, we try to be people of our word that there is another engagement activity. And so... Um, based on this presentation and even just prior knowledge, how will you incorporate current events into your teaching? And then within that, provide an example of an assignment in your course where student where current events can be adopted. So we want to spend some time here right now um, as a result of all this information. What are you thinking? You know, if you're someone who already incorporates current events, how will you think differently around that? And if you haven't prior to this moment, What's some of your initial thinking? No judgment. Feel free to put it in the chat. We would love for you to come on camera, but let's do some group think. What are you thinking now as a result of all of our contributions to this presentation today? Let's get some dialogue going. And actually, I'm going to actually stop sharing my screen for the moment just so we can see each other and really get into some, get into some dialogue. All right. Any takers? And I'm posting the questions here in the chat as a reminder. There we are. I appreciate the pointers about how to manage time reflections in class, right? I use current events in class and I also have my students read proposed legislation from states and then present their findings as a small group, all right? All right. Thank you. I love the idea of fostering bravery. Absolutely. And um, for those, um, and if one of my colleagues or someone can find this article quickly, it's like my go-to, um, Arayo and Clemens 2013. If you type it in Google Scholar, it's the first thing that comes up, but um, that, that's one of my go-tos. So it's um, about how to foster bravery in classes. And there's some guidelines and things to consider as an instructor as you do that. So it's a good how-to piece um as well all right so we just gave you some content we had people come in and talk about how they're doing it what are you thinking right now you all came here for various reasons what are you thinking all right mac unmute there um so yeah, so I, I was typing this in the chat and I was like, you know what, might as well just say it. Um, so I typically teach biology, virology, STEM related things um, and haven't usually incorporated current events. I tend to, you know, focus more on the content or focus on, you know, reading research papers, right? That's a huge portion of what, of what I do and what we do in our classes. Um, but one of my main goals for students is really helping them learn how to evaluate like the knowledge that they'll see out in the world. So like scientific ar like articles from a magazine or something like that. So that's maybe less current events, but it's more um, 
but I'm thinking about how I can incorporate like more current event stuff. So like what's actually going on in the science world? Like for example, when someone modified embryos of babies, like it, I would be much more able to incorporate that, have students um, just like respond to that and see how they see how they're thinking about it, see how they're seeing the scientific literature talk about it and also how they see the media talk about it and like comparing that, contrasting that. I don't know, these are all just kind of like thinking ideas, kind of just thinking out loud, but I mm. I really appreciate the uh, the point that you made, Felton, about not wanting to be the person who's doing all of the thinking. Um, and I think I need to do some more thinking so that I can help my students do the thinking. I appreciate that reflexivity, so important, right? You know, as, as instructors, this is a critical part. You know, we have our thing and this is what we do and we all can learn, learn and grow. And so I appreciate the open reflexivity. Looks like Moya came off camera. I think there's a comment coming. <laughs> Actually, no comment other than oh, this, okay. this oh. is excellent. I just know what it's like to be presenting on Zoom and I know how I feel when I see faces. So <laughs> there's that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Other reactions? Anyone feeling, oh, I'm going to do this now. Oh, I didn't think of this before. Actually, I don't have a current events assignment at all in my course, and I'm going to have one in the spring. Like, what? any reactions? I never thought about my philosophy as it related to this assignment and how I can align it with my promotion and tenure things in my unit, right? So anything, we can keep going, but we did want to hold some space here if needed. I, uh, I will, author. Oh. I, I will, will share. Okay, go ahead, Moya, then author. Go okay, ahead. sorry. Yeah, no, please. I will, will share briefly that I am planning to create a course that centers uh, immigrant youth in K through 16 um, education. And so immigration is always a topic in the news, some aspect of it. And so this conversation has helped me think about, first of all, it has compelled me to make sure I include uh, current events work in my course design. And, and just, um, I don't think I will have a lack of opportunities to do so. And so given the topic, and so thank you for, for this information. Thank you, thank you. Author. Yeah, thank you all for what you presented so far. Um, and something that one one of the items that really caught my eye was the liberatory conscious framework. Uh, so I would like to hear a little bit more about that. Like, how do you introduce it to? Do you introduce the framework, or is it something that you just use in terms of how you go about um, presenting your pedagogy to the students? Uh, how do you how do you incorporate it? Yeah. So. Um... I introduced the liberatory conscious framework in the beginning of the semester, and we end every classroom thinking about the liberatory conscious framework and what accountability are they taking, right? What a, we, we do analysis in the class, and then what is their role in, in, in sh shifting the system? I think one of the things that, Arthur, that I do inside of my class is we talk about so many policy areas. I'm always trying to get students to figure out what is their impact, what is their role, and what is their area? And so the liberatory conscious framework is really a part, part of that process, but it is something that we spend time with at the end of every class, um, literally talking about where are you, right? Um, because you did all of this reading and you're hearing all these problems or challenges in these readings. Let's do more analysis in class through discussion, through current events, through um, my lecture notes, and then let's figure out what is your role in this? Or do you not have a role, right? Do you not have the expertise to really deal with this policy area? So the liberatory conscious framework uh, is a huge part of my course. The other thing I want to add to this is I have five concerns. And in every class that I teach, there are five concerns that I lay out. And we address those five concerns throughout the readings every lecture. And so as part of those concerns, students are situating themselves around this liberatory conscious framework, trying to figure out how do I answer um, those questions. And I'm happy to talk more offline about the way I design my courses, but they all have five concerns. 
we explore those five concerns in every reading and we're figuring out what's our role in answering these questions and do we or do we not have the, the ex experience or expertise to solve this problem. And they ultimately write a big proposal at the end. And so that helps them write this big proposal that they write. And thank you. I appreciate that. You know, I like, I think I organically use bits and pieces of that, but you know, someone that's not trained as a, as a instructor, um, you know, coming into this from a different area of work, I never had a way to put it all together like that. So I, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Love the shared learning here. Thank you for that. Anything else you're thinking? All right, we'll do two things here. We'll jump into some broader, because our last slide literally was a lessons learned slide. So we'll just start talking about some of the lessons that we've learned along the way. Um, and hopefully that can lead into a broader dialogue as well. And if you have some broader questions, feel free to put those in the chat so we can definitely address them. Felton, you want me to start or you want to start? I want to start with one because it's really big for me. And I just run into it this semester around timing. <laughs> um, you know, one, one of the things that happened to me was I had too many students in a class and sometimes I needed two current events to be able to get through all the students before the semester would be over. Mm. And so I needed to adjust time. So I moved them. They were no longer 20 minutes. Um, so I had to adjust them on the weeks that there were two. Another variable that I did not control for when I had this bright idea was that what if a student needed to miss their current event? How would we actually make that up? And so I ran into an issue where student there were two students who needed to make up a current event. And the only time that was left was on the week that I had two people presenting. So I would have had three current events. And so it was a challenge that I ran into that I think I would encourage other folks to be mindful of. I'm solving around it in the future that, you know, students will, you know, record them and, and, and submit them or, you know, you could be rigid and say you can't make up the grade, right? You got to be there for the class that you sign up for. And so I'm working through my own philosophy and what kind of educator I want to be with regard to this challenge. But I did want to name that tension bridge that I'm walking across right now with current events. I appreciate the notion of timing. And I think, and, and I, I don't think I've landed on the right thing, quote unquote, the right thing to do here, because yeah, like on the first day we're signing up. Okay. So let's say there are 17 people in the course and there's 15 weeks, right? So you're doubling up, right? But to your point, you know, what happens? Oh, I, I'm sick or I have to miss class. Emergency happens. You still have to do the current event. And I think one thing that I've learned is that having three in one week, it's overkill. <laughs> and, I, and I think I've learned that over the years. Um, I think in terms of timing, another thing that I've had to challenge myself, I think there's a good balance between co-constructed learning where students are owning the current event, right? 20 minutes, but then the discussion is really good. I mean, like it's, and sometimes it may align with my lesson, do you allow it to go over? Because there's been times where, yeah, it's 20 minutes, but then I look at the clock, it's 35 minutes and we're still talking about the current event, right? And sometimes, you know, is that a good thing? So you have to adjust, right? Like based on the week, based on the flow, there's no perfect science, but timing is important. Because what I don't want to happen is if the discussion really is like leaning into something where I'm going to address it later or like if the if the conversation is so fruitful and it's really like the class is vibing, I try my best not to stop it. But then there are times where I'm like, you know something, I, I need to keep going. So it's just really knowing yourself, right? Um, and that's an important piece. And there's no right answer, but it's something you need to be mindful of as you're doing this assignment. An I'll introduce another lessons learned. I think for me, and I wrote down here. Um, I wrote it down somewhere. Oh yeah, here we go. Uh, ownership, right? So timing is one thing, but I remember when I first started doing this, and again, I do mine more as a compliance assignment, but I also want students to own it, right? So I remember in those initial courses, oh, I'll send something out. I'll present five minutes. I'll ask you some questions. Great, right? And I noticed that the assignment wasn't doing, and it was this engagement piece. So forcing you to design an activity that was a lesson learned. When I added that component to the assignment, 
that's when I started noticing like the classroom dynamics shifting a bit because it was the current event, but it was also the activity, right? Is it think, pair, share? Is it um, uh, a mural? And like, I pose a question, you're typing in your phone or like Padlet, uh, poll everywhere, right? Like you started seeing students use different ways to engage their peers. And I think that's the piece that was helpful for me. So early on, I'm like, yeah, I love the assignment, but it's not hitting right. Like it's not doing what I wanted it to do. Like my outcomes aren't being met. And that engagement piece. So again, something very small, but it was very transformative to the learning space. So I would say that's another lesson learned for me. Yeah, I think that's pretty. So another one for me is I students started asking to meet with them about their presentation before it. <laughs> and so I somehow unknowingly created a culture where every student thought they needed to meet with me before they presented this current event. And they all wanted my opinion around the quality of their current event and to review their activity. So I kind of got myself in a place where I was meeting with every student about their current event before they presented it. So um, I, I'm not doing that this time around. Um, I, I'm going to find a polite and kind and loving way to say that to our scholars. But um, that is a lesson learned. That like once you review one and give them feedback, they all are going to be expecting that in advance of their presentation. So that, that is another lesson learned for me. You know, students talk to each other. So I'm sure we know that they talk. Oh, he did this for me. He'll do it. For, and yeah. So again, I know for me, full transparency, right? Like I'm all about working smarter and not harder, right? And I think I just try to employ that because we are all like pulled in different directions in our work. And so I think um, it's great that the students will want to own it in this way. But my intended aim when I designed the assignment, again, for me, it's a compliance exercise, but more so that compliance is, I don't want students thinking about points. It's like, at the end of the day, pick something, engage the class, you're good, right? <laughs> but the idea that they want to meet and actually talk through and that, like for me, it, it's counter to what I designed and thought about it. So it's something to think about, right? There's a balance. Because I, I love the fact that students are engaged, right? And I think that's the piece that is exciting. There's a student engagement part, but then there's this other piece where like, wait a minute, I, in my head, I devoted X amount of time for this assignment. And now this is becoming a lot more in terms of bandwidth. And so it's, the timing is definitely something to think about. Another lesson learned that I think could be good for the group. And I think I'm even challenged in my own thinking right now. It was one of the examples I always had this as, how can I bring this into my course in a way to um, foster deeper engagement around content and material and making connections, right? Um, for all the things, for transformation, for belonging. Um, but then there's this other piece where what also happens in the current event, like in real time, right? We talk about timing, we talk about those pieces, but I think another lesson learned for me is like when things go left, right? <laughs> like, like the unaccounted, you talk about the Arnie Duncan example, right? Like when things actually don't go as according to plan in the current event, like how to actually like main, maintain control. Um, I teach a lot of controversial topics, right? And so again, in my courses, and so for me, it's the emotional part of the current event. <laughs> I don't think we talk about it. So we talk about the technical components about how to do the assignment, but what, what is really happening on the grounds when someone's offering a topic and there's disagreement, how to like civilly disagree. So some of those pieces, and I think lessons learned when you are, and, and this goes back to my earlier point about creating a classroom environment that promotes bravery, right? And so, and, and not to go too off topic here, but I think the things are very connected. I think how you design your course plays a big role in the assignments that you have. They're all connected. It's not, you know, as, and we need to think about these in synergistic ways. I think for me, when course discussions are, um, can be polarizing at times, I think because of the classroom environment that I strive to create, that students can actually disagree <laughs> civilly, meaningfully respect one another. And, but there are times where that didn't happen, right? And so it's like, what do you do? So I think a lesson learned 
in my rambling here, but the lesson is making sure that you are designing and fostering a classroom environment that is suitable to even do this type of assignment in the first place, right? So there's some learning and some things that need to happen before the current event itself. Yeah, and that connects to, you know, one of the lessons learned that I'm bringing into this, um, that I'm going to take it a step further, Brian. I was not prepared for a student to say something racist as much mm -hmm. as I should be uh, prepared for someone to say something racist. And um, we were able to work through it. But I think what it reminded me of is a greater need to focus on habits of discussion and how do we actually support students in their journey of when someone says something racist, how do we actually call them in? There's a New York Times article that says if instead of calling people out, what if we call them in? Mm -hmm. And so in my next class, I had to reset a good bit. And we actually had to read this article about calling in versus calling out to be able to set students up that when someone said something that was racist or sexist or homophobic or any of those things, um, we needed to have a protocol in place to work through that in a way. Because one of my you know, classroom norms is that we assume positive intent, but we name impact. Yes. And so I needed to give them a tool to name impact um, in a way that would make the conversation productive. And so um, I'll, I'll drop the article in the chat, but that is one of my lessons learned. I love that. I love that. I need I need to take that. <laughs> right. So even this shared learning in this moment as well. Let's see. All right, my, my dear colleague, Mac, not to shamelessly plug, but we have a great session later today on calling in. So you know something, Mac? I was thinking about your session. Let me stop. No, <laughs> no I love that. <laughs> I love that. So yes, definitely to extend on that. I love when, when things just naturally align. Um, thank you for sharing the article as well. Any reactions to our lessons learned? Any reactions? and to take care of ourselves, check in with ourselves and facilitators. So let me lean into this comment. And if, Moya, if you want to come on and say more, feel free. But it's so important, right? And I think, um, and I'll drop this article, and my dear colleague Sherry Watkins is on the call here today, too. We wrote a piece that looked at um, facilitating difficult dialogues um, where um, Black faculty talked about their experiences across nine courses facilitating difficult dialogues and some of the lessons learned around that. So I'll find that article as well. But this whole notion of taking care of yourself was one of the themes that came out of this, right? When you're engaging in this type of work, it's emotional labor and it's making sure that you're in a place to even do this work, right? Because if you're not okay, like you can't be effective to others. So I think that piece um, is so important. So I just want to lift that up. Um, with the current event assignment, yes, it could be one vehicle, but just in teaching in general, just being mindful of um, thinking about centering wellness in this type of work is so critical and important and having your support systems in place. And we draw on that. We Sometimes we talk about content so often that we forget the humanity parts of this. Um, and it's just very important. So um, I love that. Other thoughts and reactions? We have about 10 more minutes left in the session. I can offer another lesson learned, but I want this to be very fruitful for you all because one of our outcomes, we want you all to think about how to meaningfully do this moving forward. And so just a quick recap, you know, and I, I call it compliance assignment for the lack of a better term, but like I do it in this way for deeper engagement that decentering like points, but more about doing it. There's one that's deeply connected with the rubric that students engage in that way. So Felton talked about that. We had an example where there's an occurring event that's actually tied to a broader semester long assignment. And then there was this course around current events organically happening in the, in the um, context of a course, even unprompted and unplanned, right? So those are four different ways that current events, are there other ways that this could happen or you're thinking about? Again, so consider this as a group think. I have an idea and you have a captive audience to think with. And anyone who knows me, I do group thinks a lot. So if, if you have something, feel free. We don't get these opportunities often. <laughs> 
I'm also happy with ending this session 10 minutes early too, because I'm also not in a place to keep people in a space that just for the sake of doing it. So um, I'll just- Yeah, folks got, folks got what they need. Yeah. To the challenge. Going once, going twice. And so I'm going to, let's see. Yep, let me do the same thing here. And so just- drop my email in the chat if anybody wants to reconnect or if you got any good advice for me. So not just- Teasing my brain. If you've got something to share, I'd love to. That could be true. So, Felton, to close this out, um, let's do final takeaways. There, based on all of this, based on our session, our dialogues leading up to this, any final takeaway you have that's floating in your head, and I'll do one behind yours. Yeah, I think my biggest takeaway from you know doing this presentation, working on the article, talking with folks today is that there's a lot of dope folks out there who are thinking about ways to engage folks in college teaching. And so I originally came into college teaching thinking that people didn't care about it as much because of my experience as you know you all do. And so to hear you all today to be thinking deeply around how do you engage students? I'm feeling a sense of community that I'm not alone in this. I feel like I can reach out to Matt and they can help me um, as I try to make my class much better. I feel like I can reach out to Arthur and and, and have some community. Amoya, all of you, I feel like I have a community now. Um, and then the final piece for those of you who are being mentored by a faculty member, um, think about ways to do stuff with your with your faculty mentor, um, because it, it, you know, this has been great for me. I was getting feedback from Brian on like how to make this better, ideas. It was just another way for me to engage in a mentor moment. So um, those are my two takeaways. Appreciate that. I'm going to lean into the mentoring here um, because it, it's so important, right? And, and and mentoring is reciprocal. It's not top down. And I just think co-constructed environments, um, I, I feed off of, I'm, I, I'm an energy person, so I feed off of energy, but I just think creating spaces for shared learning is so critical. So a takeaway is how can I do that in my courses for students so we can co-construct, but also how am I doing that for myself as a member of this community, right? And so, um, and CTRL has a plethora of ways to do that. And so that's one space, having a dual appointment. I know we talked a lot about SOE and the things that we did to start this presentation, but having a dual head, I'm afforded opportunities to see day to day how CTRL does that as well. And so um, just take advantage of, of that. So if you have questions about how to do this better, um, feel free to not just attend our programs, but reach out to us. We have lots of expertise. And so um, just a shameless plug around that. Um, and Rebecca, I'm going to give you, yes, space. Feel free, Rebecca, jump on really quickly. Sure, yeah. Um, sorry, I was just thinking back. I know there's been a lot of discussion since then, but um, a few minutes ago, you all were talking about the habits of discussion and calling in versus calling out um, and those kind of classroom dynamics. And I was just thinking about a little later today, there's a session on habits um, and both habits academically and, um, you know, student behaviors, faculty behaviors and all of that. And I was just wondering if I could um, make a little reference to what you were speaking about um, or even, you know, ask you to unmute and share at that moment if you happen to be in the session. Absolutely. So feel free, like, yes, um, please. So support the, the activities that are happening later. So um, with that being said, I'm going to, um, Nazia, we're good? I get my, my, my marching orders to make sure, yes. So there is an evaluation. Um, please um, fill it out. We do read the evaluations and we, they do play a role in our programming that we offer. So please take a second. If you can do that right now, it's very quick. That would be great. But beyond that, just thank you, thank you, thank you for being a community with us today. Um, this was fun and it felt and it's always a pleasure to to talk, to talk, work in these types of ways is really nice. So thank you.